Ex-Muslims are not real. Today we are going to expose ex-Muslims and I will talk with you guys about four types of ex-Muslims and what I've recently experienced in my comment section by so-called ex-Muslims. Let's see what Javon here has to say. I have been chronically online for many years. When I was just four years old, my mom put me on a computer with a stack of education video games. I wow. taught myself math, I taught myself how to read. At a very young age, because I didn't go to preschool, my mom stayed at home and took care of me. And I haven't quite decided if being introduced to computers early on was a blessing or a curse. Now that I use it for work, it seems to be a blessing and I've got to meet a lot of cool people and we have this large community of like-minded individuals. But there is sometimes, some days, some videos that I come across that just baffle me. And after so many years of digging the internet and seeing the craziest content ever, you would be surprised. And it is just at that moment that you think you have seen it all where you discover ex-Muslims. Ex-Muslim content is some of the most confusing things I've ever yeah. seen in the world. And I'm gonna cut to the chase on this one and then break it down after, but there is no such thing as an ex-Muslim. After watching these videos, I am fully convinced that ex-Muslims don't exist. These individuals individuals may have been raised in an Islamic household, their parents may be Muslims, exactly. maybe they have a cousin that's a Muslim. But I can guarantee not a single one of these individuals have opened the Quran and saw words on that page. Now, that is actually true what he said. So let me share you, with you guys a story of mine, right? So <laughs> the other day I actually checked my comment sections and sometimes I get like messages or like comments by ex-Muslims and they're saying Islam is false, there are mistakes and this and that. And there was an ex-Muslim and I had to laugh at this, right? This ex-Muslim wrote in my comment section, <laughs> this is not a joke guys, it's a bit funny to me because it's, it's, it's so sad that it's funny basically, right? So this person claimed that the Quran was sent down as a book to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, so I was like, wait, what? How was it sent down as a book? It was sent down in a, in a recitation, right? And that person had no clue that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could not read when uh, Jibril Alaihi Salam came. And, and, and then at some point, uh, Jibril Alaihi Salam said to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, recite. And then our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recited to the Muslims. It did not come down with a book like that. Uh, Jibril Alaihi Salam physically brings a book to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But there was an ex-Muslim that claimed that. And I was like, this person, was this person really a Muslim? Like, who taught Islam to this person? How did this person not know that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could not uh, read and write? This is basic knowledge for a Muslim, like kids learn this, right? So what he said right now, what Drevan said, this is so true because if someone really opened the Quran, had any clue, they would know this, right? So yeah, <laughs> this is actually funny. I've seen these individuals in the comment section. They act like a yeah. cockroach in a toilet bowl. They pop out of nowhere and you they're too. disgusting, but you they're not really see. scary. This brings me to a point that I actually learned recently. Disgust and fear are two different things and ex-Muslims have solidified that piece of information for me. When I first reverted to Islam, I knew nothing about the community or very little. Yeah. You know, there had been a couple videos that I made on TikTok that had popped off and touched some Muslim viewers, but I didn't really know too much about the community as a whole. And of course, just like every community, there is rats in the pit. And when yeah. you go through the ex-Muslim content on YouTube, it is just brain melting. I felt my brain cells pulling the trigger on themselves multiple times. Every uh, wasn't it this with uh, Sam Shimon or what his name is? I can't even pronounce his name. <laughs> I think it's Sam Shimon, right? Um, he actually said, oh, I'm also like ex-Muslim, this and that, but he doesn't even speak Arabic. So even like when you hear him like trying to read parts of the Quran Arabic, like it, it doesn't sound correct. <laughs> so, so how can someone be an ex-Muslim or come from a Muslim family or country? But they don't even know how to recite something in Arabic, even though they actually have this in their family to learn that even, right? Like this is something I see here a lot in, in Germany and this is actually very saddening. Like we have a lot of non-Muslim Muslims. And what do I mean by non-Muslim Muslims? So we have like a lot of people here in Germany and this is sad. That's why we have to actually push the Dawah here. Also, I have to uh, speak again with like my local masjid because I actually have the idea to actually bring a Dawah table to my city if we can. And I actually want to cooperate with some brothers and do this here. I hope we can do this inshallah. And 
we have like some people here that come from, let's say, Turkish families, from families from from Albania, from families from from even Tunisia, and they have nothing to do with Islam. You see them eat pork, drink alcohol, have girlfriends, boyfriends, this and that. And they don't know anything about Islam except that their family is Muslim or that they have like a, a grandpa that goes to Juma somewhere in, in Turkey or somewhere, right? But if you see them here, they will like, they live literally like Kufa. They don't do anything with Islam. They only have like a name like, like Ahmed or Muhammad or, or Mustafa. And that's it. It's their name, right? And, and they say, oh, some grandpa of mine is a Muslim or something. And, 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 and some of them are also against Islam and they claim to be ex-Muslim. But yet when they were 12 or 13 years old, they had their uh, first cigarette and first girlfriend, whatever. They do this and that. They, they go to parties and then they say they're ex-Muslim. What did they have to do with Islam in the first place, right? It's only their name and, and, and that their grandparents are religious. Yeah, this is this is the thing, and, and it's actually interesting. So Drevon, like I, I was actually sure that Drevon gets it because I was also in his comment section. There were some strange comments as well, and I see this on every single dawa or channel about Islam, where there are people that are ex-Muslim and they make the wildest claims. I actually had the other day a person, and this person claimed to be an ex-Muslim and said there is a scientific error in the Quran. So I was like, which scientific error? And the person says. Oh, in, in this one uh, verse in the Quran, it says the earth was made in six days, but another verse says it was made in two days. That's a contradiction. So I looked at both verses and the verses, they don't say the earth was made in two and one in six days. No, one verse says the earth was created in two days and the other verse didn't say earth. The other verse said the earth and the heavens, the earth plus the heavens. Those are two time frames, not just one, just like in the other verses, one uh, frame. So two time frames, earth and heavens, in six days. So how is that a contradiction if one verse talks only about the creation of the earth and another talks about the heavens and the earth? This is two things, right? So you could say, oh, maybe the heavens took four days and, and the earth two days, because if that one verse says two days for the earth and, and this has uh, heavens uh, six days, right? So it's like four plus two, basically, you could say, right? Or someone said, Oh, it, it does not say in the Quran that the bee is female. Then I actually um, shared them something from the Arabic dictionary where the feminine, the word is used for the, for the worker bee, right? So it's like the female version of it. And then the person is silent, right? It's actually interesting because like a lot of those ex-Muslims sometimes are even wondering if they are maybe not, perhaps even atheists that claim to be ex-Muslim, right? Because did they ever even read the Quran? Did they ever do a single prayer? And how long was that ago, I wonder? Every single one of them had a very specific mannerism. Their tonality, the tonality mm. in their voice, their the movement of their face, all these little subconscious actions were very identical. First, you kind of want to chalk it up to some sort of mental illness, or maybe they had a similar trauma within their childhood. But when you look deeper at it and the articulation of their voice and the specific word choice they use, it seems a little bit more than just a physical or mental illness. Because these people are from different places they have different experiences and different upbringings. Why is the tonality in their voice identical? Why is the movements in their face exactly the same as one another? Especially when they're from completely opposite places on the planet. How is their English articulated the exact same way? Mm -hmm. These questions are what's stumping me right now. And this really, really, really seems to be the work of the shaitan. Well, I really pray yeah. that Allah forgives them for the blasphemy they're spouting on the internet. But I this mean... does scream attachment. Now, I'm not talking about the individuals that went from Islam to Christianity either. Those people, I don't think they're very far lost. I don't think they're very far gone. They went to the cousin of Islam. They went to the one with the DLCs and updates that may have been corrupted, but at least they're somewhere close. They're somewhere nearby. I'm talking about the individual. Um, the same goes actually for those that uh, convert to Christianity. So there are actually, for the most part, two types of ex-Muslims that become Christian. And one is they are literally doing it out of love for someone. They're like those people that end up in a haram relationship. And I've actually um, saw, I've saw like a couple of stories and individuals like that. They fall into a haram relationship. They're actually Muslims, right? But then for their haram relationship, they're actually changing their faith. 
And this happens sadly to a lot of sisters I've experienced where they sometimes will convert to Christianity for their husband because in Islam, as a Muslim woman, you can't marry a Christian husband, right? So if that woman wants to be with a Christian dude, she has to literally, like, either she lives like in a haram way or she leaves her religion. So I, I've heard about stories like that where women for a guy converted to Christianity and was like misled that way because she fell into haram and then she grew some attachment towards this individual. So this is one uh, type of um, ex-Muslim that became a Christian. And the second type of of ex-Muslim that became a Christian is the one that comes from a Muslim family but was not educated about Islam. Because Islam, if you really study Islam and you got the foundation and you understand Tawhid, the belief in just one God, you would actually see like where Christianity went uh, wrong at what point and how Jesus, peace be upon him, cannot be the son of, of Allah. It makes no sense because this was something I even thought as a Christian before I became a Muslim. Like, how can there be one individual that was created without a father and a mother from clay? How can there be one individual that was created from a rib? How can there be other prophets that did miracles? Like one split the sea, uh, one split the moon. Um, like other prophets did miracles too, just like Jesus, peace be upon him, right? And, and, and they were created without parents or, or from a rib. Why are they not children of, of God? Why is it not mentioned in the Bible, right? And if God even is, is described in the Bible as someone that says, be so there is and can create everything. So how comes that Jesus specifically is the son, peace be upon, is the son of God and not the creation of God, while Adam and Eve, for example, were also created in miraculous ways, right? So this was a big contradiction. If, and if a Muslim has the base knowledge and this understanding, just, just, just like I have, right? Or that if Jesus was God, why did God die and then was resurrected? And said, like if a Muslim really learns that, like it makes no sense if that Muslim becomes a Christian, unless it is out of love or because there was no knowledge in the first place. So yeah, this is why, yeah, ex-Muslims, this is like, they were not in the deen. Except maybe traumatic ex-Muslims. And I will actually talk about this at the end of the video because I will explain you actually the four types of ex-Muslims I have encountered in my life. Individuals that went from Islam to no faith at all. They went nowhere. And that's mind-blowing. Because how can you go from religious to atheist? And I understand I did yeah. something similar, but at the end of the day, I always knew something more existed. It wasn't that I just didn't believe in anything ever. Most people who get out of religion go the spiritual path. When I was in anger management, when I was like 19 years old, got my first assault charge as an adult, there was this teacher, Mary. She was an older woman, very sweet, but very stern. She went across the class of these angry dudes that all had assault charges and asked us all whether we were spiritual or religious. And every single one of us, we answered whether we were spiritual or religious. And at the end of it, she told us, she said, religion is for people who are scared to go to hell. Spirituality is for people who have been through it. And that's something that stuck with me pretty mm. hard but there was never a third option there was never a, I don't believe in anything at all and seeing these ex-muslims videos it seems that they have a very similar energy to a group of individuals in America I can't name them but we'll just call them the confused group and the confused <laughs> group and these ex-muslims have this theatrical emotion with them where everything about them seems to be exaggerated and they go around just attacking everybody else over and over again and they never really support their own point and this is a major red flag for me, especially being on the internet for a while. I've had to be careful. I've had a lot of people that I've collabed with in the early TikTok yeah. days. And then the second their views dropped, they made videos talking crap about me. So I've been able to identify certain groups of individuals that are very narcissistic or hold narcissistic qualities. Hold on real quick. I got to do some dawah to the squirrel. The squirrel didn't let me get close. I think he's the shaitan. That's cute. Anyway, these individuals seem to live in their own reality. They make their own rules and anything that they disagree with, they just act like it isn't a thing. They don't want to hear anybody else's perspective or anybody else's information. And as yeah, this is the same with like this one individual that recently wrote so many appar apparently um, scientific errors in the in the Quran that I actually disproved. Like I said, hey, this is not a mistake, right? Or for example, like I said, this with the earth creation, how long it takes. And in one verse, oh, it's two days, but in one it's six. But actually in the verse where it says six days, there's the heavens included, not just the earth, right? Or where someone claimed that, no, it doesn't say the honeybee is female, this and that. Like this sort of people, if you actually give them feedback, 
you know that they are not sincere in even finding the truth because even after I I actually debunked this person said hey this is actually false what you're saying or for example about jihad right like I even got the other day a, a verse about that uh, Islam is from an apparently ex-Muslim that Islam is another person uh, that Islam is the religion of violence or something and then I actually looked at what this person actually um quoted and it was from actually the something from the battle of, of Badr right so I was like I was like dude this is with a historic context this is not a timeless comment or something right or doing the hitra or the return to, to Mecca and then this and that right or, or the verse where it says fight them wherever you see them this doesn't talk about our time this talk talks about a historic content with fight them wherever you see them like this doesn't mean we are doing this now it just talks about a, a certain moment when the muslims are trying to protect their lives and and have a land to live in right this did not talk about um do this now or a timeless comment that applies to every single day in life no this was a historic context and this is the interesting part because all the ex-muslims also seem to use the same sources and same doubts and if you actually show them that they are false or that they take something out of context or they're using one verse but not the next one or they look at a hadith that's even unauthentic right because we have also unauthentic hadiths where there's a very weak chain of narration and where it actually even contradicts the quran at some point what doesn't make any sense right and those hadiths they are not in those authentic hadith collections even you find them even on google sometimes and some of those false hadiths could also be invented hadiths that actually have zero chain of narration that one individual wrote and just posted online right so it's actually interesting because they use the same sources to always say oh islam is not correct but then if you actually disprove their point and you say look your point is false because look it actually says this or hey there's a historic context they don't want to hear it they sometimes turn even aggressive and violent and they insult and then they say you guys you oppress women you do this and that i saw the news i saw this and that but then they change the topic immediately if, if they bring a point and you actually show them that there's no error. This is, this is, this is like so weird about ex-Muslims because there's like a lot of emotion and it's not like the sincerity where they actually want to know what's going on or see the truth, right? Now, if you go, for example, to scientists, right? Like one scientist has a theory about something and one scientist has a theory about something. So they both bring out their points and they're comparing it or something, right? And they're having a very legit discussion and debate without insulting one another where both are representing the facts. And I've noticed that ex-Muslims, they're often using insults and emotion and they're not comparing two facts. So it's like they're actually coming to see conflict or something. This is how it feels like. I've read this in my comment section where people were coming immediately with hate instead with, hey, I have doubts. Um, can you clear my doubts? Or hey, I think you are wrong because I have this and this point. No, they don't come with, I think you are wrong. No, they, they, they come like, oh, I, you're wrong. You're a horrible person. You're a liar. You're a scammer. You're this and that. They come already with like a certain stance towards Islam, right? And then you have to like, discuss with them points and if you prove your point they get even more violent sometimes and, and they use bad words and stuff even it's very it's very disturbing sometimes to see this as muslims i urge us all to pick up the bible and read through it maybe you don't have to become a christian or study everything but it's helpful to understand somebody else's perspective now i don't recommend jumping into lesser key of solomon and some of the really deep and dark occult books but maybe studying the other religions of the world can help us understand other people but there's something i want everybody to be very careful of especially online and watching videos the individuals that don't make content where it's just them sharing their own beliefs and their experiences we need to be careful of them if somebody only makes videos talking negatively about somebody else, that is dangerous. Nobody listens to their videos unless somebody else's name is coming out of their mouth. Right now, the shaitan are everywhere. I have never at any point in time seen this amount of people with demonic attachments ever. It is yeah. crazy to see the amount of people in America who have a shaitan directly attached to them. They're selling so their the souls. important question is, what can we do about these individuals? What can we do to try to prevent chaos from happening? 
happening or prevent them from tearing down the rest of society and other communities and leading people towards Iblis or the yeah, devil. Yeah, we need to create well, awareness of this. I said earlier in the video where there's a difference between fear and disgust. This is one trick to identify these individuals. See, individuals of this energy, of this class, they work based off of fear. They're scared of everything. And the way you can tell that somebody's fearful is they're gonna have exaggerated emotions. They become very primitive. They're gonna scream and yell and not let you get your point across because they're scared of you. They wanna to try to intimidate you back. Where mm -hmm. the issue is, is that's never gonna work. If you're they're doing street dawa, yeah. doing something similar along these lines, you're gonna be operating more out of disgust or compassion really is what it's gonna be, but it's more disgust. We don't fear the devil. We don't fear the opposite side, but it's similar to like a rotten cheeseburger on the side of the road. We're not scared of it, but we're still going to avoid and if you're doing street dawa and you're getting in conflict with individuals that are on the other side, you're not going to be avoiding it. You're going to be confronting the disgust head on and yeah. watching people and like the Warner and Usman and seeing how they interact with individuals of this type. It is compassion that beats them. Being compassionate towards these individuals that are sick and twisted may be able to pull them out of it. But if compassion doesn't work, I will go find that squirrel and his buddies, convince a bunch of squirrels to revert, and we will use them as personal bodyguards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah let's like the video to support squirrel dawa i'm gonna like this video now okay so now very very important guys i want to actually mention to you the four types of ex-muslims that i have encountered in my life so the first type and this was actually quite common here in germany and th those are the muslims that come from an Muslim country where the majority are Muslim or from a Muslim family and often the families aren't really practicing Islam or they only know the basics. Sometimes their parents don't even do the five prayers, uh, the mother doesn't wear the hijab and, and, and they only have let's say a name from a certain country where the majority are Muslim there right and they're sometimes called Ahmed, Muhammad, Mustafa, Bilal. They have all, all sorts of names where you identify them from the name as a Muslim their passport sometimes says I'm from this country or if you ask them oh my my grandparents they ca came from there then they came to Germany then my parents were born but my parents they are not religious this and that like sometimes they even admit that their parents are not praying or really religious and that they were not sent to Quran Quran school and this and that right so the first type is the Muslim that grew up un-Islamically with a Kufa environment there was like no knowledge taught really right then you have the second type of ex-Muslim and that is the traumatic experience ex-Muslim. Those are sometimes kids that were abused by their parents, their parents mistreated them or they had a lover or were married. It can be for example a sister that met a bad brother and the, bro the brother was violent and evil to her and really horrible that she actually started to hate Islam. It can also happen to like boys if their parents are too strict, maybe they they abuse them or something, right? And the parents are totally misguided. So there's like this traumatic experience or someone's maybe attacked by a Muslim and yeah. So this is the, the, the one thing also like a, a emotional roller coaster they had in the past that led to some traumatic experience that made them dislike Islam. Then there's the third type of ex-Muslim and those are fake ex-Muslims and their parents are sometimes even Christians or they're atheists and they come perhaps from a country that is Muslim. But even in those countries, you have the five or 10 percent of that population that are either Christian or atheist or some some other religion or even Hinduism, right? And then they say, oh, I'm an ex-Muslim, but they have nothing to do with Islam. Even if you ask their parents, their parents were already atheists. So they are not even like Muslim, you could say, right? Because they have like nothing to do. Even their parents have nothing to do with the religion, right? So it's not like non-practicing Muslim parents. It's actually non-Muslim parents. But just because someone from their family some generations ago is from there and there, that makes them ex-Muslim. That's false. Like to be a Muslim, you have to also have at least some source of Islam, right? Like maybe your parents or so on, right? Because then I can call everyone an ex-Muslim, even the child of a Christian family. Oh, this guy is an ex-Muslim. Uh, the child of a Hindu family. Oh, that's an ex-Muslim, right? So, so at least your parents must be Muslim to count as an ex-Muslim, right? Now, there's a fourth group, and this is the saddest group of ex-Muslims. And this is where we as a community have failed them, as a Ummah have failed them. And this is the ex-Muslim of a revert. So, so how does this happen? So someone is being given dawah to, they get 
maybe the basic principles of Islam explain that there's just one God, that there were many prophets, but one message, this and that, right? And then they say the Shahada, they accept Islam. And they're Muslim for like several weeks, right? But they return to their old environment, to their jahiliya, their non-Muslim friends, back to their old habits. Some have a haram relationship and their spouse is upset because they said the shahada. And they are literally left by themselves after saying the shahada. They're not being connected with brothers or sisters and they're not being taught Islam further. They basically just get a bit of information. They say the Shahada return to their old environment and it's over. Right. And, and after some years or months, they are no longer even identifying as Muslim anymore. And those are the ex Muslims that were reverts, but they were completely sent back to their old environment and they had only been given a bit of information about Islam. But it but at this time they were like convinced of Islam, but later on they didn't learn any further and they actually went astray because of that. So we as a Ummah, if we see new rewards, we need to connect them. We need to get their phone number and not just save their number, actually talk to them sometimes, invite them to the masjid for maybe some some chai, some some tea or something, right? Like connect with them. Don't just say, oh, say the Shahada and, 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 and Assalamu Alaikum and it's over. Wa Alaikum Salam, right? So, so we have to be very, very careful with that. And yeah, there's like a last advice I also want to give to um, parents and you have to be very, very careful, especially if you're living in a Western country as parents, because if you don't want your child to become an ex-Muslim, you need to teach them Islam from an early age and not start when they are 16, because when they're 16, for example, or even 15, they are very rebellious. They want to explore life in their own pace, in their own way. Right. And it's too late to teach them about Islam. You have to start with an early age. Start even maybe as a baby with one or two years of age. Pray in front of your children. Teach them to cook the Quran already when they are three years or four years or like start early, please. Because if you don't, they become Muslims that just like in my comment section, don't know that the Quran was first a message of recitation and later on people wrote it down and collected the surahs, right? Because like it's crazy when an individual calls uh, herself or himself an ex-Muslim and then they don't even know that the Quran was not sent as a physical book but as a recitation, right, at first. So this is, this is insane, right? And yeah, um, there's even an authentic hadith where our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that seeking knowledge is an obligation to every Muslim. And this is a Sahih Hadith. And this is true because even the Quran, it actually encourages us to seek knowledge, right? And what we as parents have to be aware of for our children, and this is very, very important or for those that plan to have children, that even our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that all of us are shepherds and we are responsible for our flock. So we have to make sure that our children, they don't go astray and that they get the right knowledge. And then we also check the sources they learn from. Because it's very important, because if, if you're not taking the responsibility as a husband, as a father, as a mother for your children, they, they can go astray and you will be also responsible for that, right? Like, sure, it says in the Quran, O Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you are not the one who guides, who, you're not the one who guides uh, whoever you, you will. It is Allah that guides the people. This is true, but we are always a factor for our community, for our children. And if we are not helping them to learn about the deen, then they will not understand it. They will go astray at some point. We are responsible. Like ultimately it's up to Allah. And this is also what, what, what in the tafsir, because this is the tafsir I've read, what it means by, O oh, Prophet, you are not the one who guides, but it's Allah the one who guides, right? Because ultimately the guidance, the hidayah is up to Allah, but we are on the road to guide the people and we are doing it. And if Allah wants it, the individuals, they will be guided. But this, this verse doesn't mean you sit at home, you teach your children nothing and they become practicing Muslims when they're older because Allah is the one who guides. No, that's not what the verse in the Quran means. It only means that ultimately Allah is responsible, but you are partially responsible. So you have to understand this well. 
But yeah, guys, I hope this video was informative for you. And yeah, if you guys are new to this channel, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button for more content. If you guys enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give this one a thumbs up. And I will see you guys next time, inshallah.